Adult Services at the Groton Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you to a very special evening with Monty Irvin, Remembering Baseball. This evening is part of the One Book, One Region project, which encouraged residents to read Snow in August by Pete Hamill. Snow in August takes place in Brooklyn in 1947, the year Jackie Robinson integrated the major leagues. We wanted to offer a program about this era and decided to focus on what was happening in baseball before it was integrated, which led us to tonight's, programs about, tonight's program about the Negro Leagues. I need to thank several people for making this evening possible. First, Monty Irvin. Um, I've been cheating a little bit by reading his autobiography so that it would look like I knew something about baseball, I have to admit. Um, and one thing I, I have learned from reading it, because uh, don't quiz me about baseball, is um, that we are very lucky to have him with us tonight. Um, he was a star of the Negro League, a major presence on the New York Giant, Giants in the 50s, and a universally well-liked man. I still can't believe that he's agreed to be here and to go out of his way from his home in Florida to um, come with us tonight. He truly has an interesting story to tell from his beginnings in Newark to his election to the Hall of Fame. I also need to thank Craig Davidson, the man who made the film that we'll be watching tonight. Craig can't be with us due to a family emergency, but he sent the film along, and I am uh, grateful to him forever for actually putting me in touch with Monty Irvin. Several other people are also on my list. Uh, Mark Fallon, the general manager of the Mystic Marriott, Mike Bean from Livery Limited, and a generous grant from Pfizer have made this evening possible. Uh, one last announcement. Um, we were uh, hoping not to do autographs tonight. Mr. Irvin has already signed some photographs and some baseball cards, and at the end of the evening, we'll choose winners uh, from those of you who have entered the drawing. And now I'll turn the program over to Dan Pearson, a reporter for the day and a real baseball fan who I also need to thank for stepping in uh, for me at the last moment here. Dan. Uh, hi. Uh, these days, people are so frustrated with the inflated salaries and labor disputes in Major League Baseball that they've become nostalgic for what they and the media refer to as the good old days of baseball. But the good old days of baseball were anything but good for some of the most talented and heroic baseball players in history. For many players in Negro baseball, the name given to the leagues organized and played by African Americans in the first half of the 20th century, baseball meant 10-hour road trips and run-down jalopies or broken-down buses. Baseball meant sleeping three to a bed, living on water, sardines, and bologna sandwiches. Negro League Baseball meant that even if you were home run king Josh Gibson, who supposedly hit 84 home runs in the 1936 season, even if you went down to Latin America and the fans carried you through the streets on their shoulders chanting your name, even if you joined the army and went to the World War and returned to America as a decorated soldier, it didn't matter. Major League owners and commissioners had conspired to keep baseball separate and unequal. But even if the times weren't that good for African-American ballplayers, the baseball in the Negro League certainly was. In fact, most would argue that the Negro Leagues played a better brand of baseball, a creative, fast, risky, and exciting style more akin to the modern National League, a style that highlighted steals, hit and runs, and sacrifice. And Negro League baseball had the players and the teams to make it work. There were the Chicago American Giants, the Homestead Grays, the Newark Eagles, and the Pittsburgh Crawfords. As for superstars, there was Cool Papa Bell, so fast he could score from second on a fly ball to the outfield. So fast it was said that after he hit a ball back to the pitcher, the other players in the field would yell, hurry up. There was Verdell Mathis, the master of the screwball, Mule Suttles, who supposedly hit a 598-foot home run one year in Cuba, and of course there was Jackie Robinson, the college All-American who played one year with the Kansas City Monarchs before he was signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers. After Jackie Robinson, the Negro League quickly lost its popularity. But when the Negro League disbanded, it took with it a lifetime of stories, legends, and histories of teams and players and epic games waged in front of tens of thousands of fans in Chicago, New York, San Juan, and Havana. Nowadays, a player can't get out of their Lexus without 17 reporters and three television crews crowding around for an update on their rotator cuff. But a great deal of what took place in black baseball was never recorded. This is a tragedy because it deprives generations of baseball players of the credit and immortality they deserved. It is, only a second, it is only in the second half of the last century that this changed. Since 1971, the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown has inducted 16 Negro League players. 
Many more still deserve to be inducted. There is now a Negro League Baseball Museum in Kansas City. There is even now a statue of Cool Papa Bell in St. Louis. But how did a renewed interest start? It started when individuals made the heroic effort to rediscover and preserve the history of the Negro Leagues. There are writers such as Robert Peterson, James Riley, Mark Rabowski, and John Hallway. There are former players, managers, and owners such as Monty Irvin, Effa Manley, and Buck O'Neill who campaigned on behalf of their former teammates. And there are filmmakers like Craig Davidson, the director of the film, There Was Always Sun Shining Someplace. Davidson went to the source. He went out and found these forgotten players scattered all across the country and asked the important question that, for whatever reason, hadn't been asked enough. He found Cool Papa and Mule Suttles, and he said, tell me, what was it like? Tell me about your life. The Burns answer to that question in is not only illuminating in Alabama. to baseball, when he was eight, he moved to New Jersey, where he lettered in four sports at East Orange High School. He attended Lincoln University in Oxford, Pennsylvania, until 1937 when he joined the Newark Eagles of the Negro National League. A power-hitting and fleet-footed outfielder, Irwin averaged 350, 350 with the New York Eagles. One season in the Mexican League, he batted 397. When major, when major League owners started talking about integrating baseball in the 40s, many owner, owners, managers, and players thought that more than any other player, Irwin's talent, intelligence, and character would make him the one to break the color barrier. In 1947, when Bill Veck, the owner of the Cleveland I Indians, was looking to improve his team, he scouted the stars of the ne Negro Leagues. Veck decided on Larry Doby, but the Eagles owner, Effa Manley, told Veck it would be wise to take Irvin. Veck refused, saying that Irvin was too old. That was a bad decision, about as bad as the Red Sox trading Babe Ruth. Several, several years later, when he was asked why he passed Irvin up, Veck joked about it, saying, shows you how smart I was. Why was it a bad decision? Because Irvin wasn't past his prime as a player when he entered the league in 1949. He was just starting it. Over seven seasons with the Giants, Irvin was a five-time All-Star who led the Giants to two pennants. And if there was ever a clutch player and a, a latter-day Mr. October, it had to be Monty Irvin. In the 1951 season alone, Irvin led the Giants to the pennant, batting 312 and leading the league with 112 R RBIs, finishing third in the MVP balloting. He hit 458 in the 1951 World Series and had a career World Series batting average of 394. He even stole home in the World Series. Irvin's career major league on-base percentage is 385. It's no wonder that Roy Campanella called Irvin the best all-around player he had ever seen. Irvin became the fourth veteran of Negro League Baseball to enter Hall of Fame when he was inducted in 1973. His contributions to baseball did not end there, however. He served for 17 years as a special assistant to baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn and was a member of the Hall of Fame Veterans Committee for two decades, ensuring that many other teams and players who might have been overlooked by history have received the honor they deserved. I do have some bad news for Giants fans. I found out tonight that Mr. Irvin, after playing and living in New Jersey, is a Mets fan. But um, very few players have contributed as much to preserve the integrity and dignity of the game. As our guest, I hope you will now join me in welcoming a Baseball Hall of Famer and one of the great ambassadors of the game, Monty Irvin. to be my age, you're invited to be anywhere. <laughs> and I really mean that. That's not just a cliche. I hope that you enjoy that wonderful film. I can attest to you that just about, well, I'll say 99, 9, percent of everything they said was true. Uh, that was my era. And just about every player that you've seen in there have, have passed away. That's very sad. Uh, it's just a very few of us left, and uh, we cherish every moment, though, because we saw so much of history, we helped make some history. Might not have been the best, but I've seen the best, been a lot of places, done a lot of things, and the thing that I say, that with those players, as opposed to today's players, they were very grateful, they were delighted to be playing. Uh, they played because many of them said playing baseball was better than working every day. 
So in order to succeed, we practiced a lot. Uh, we went to the played one on baseball because there, where you could work on your anything that you were deficient in, you could work on it. And a lot of us, after playing all season in the states, we go down to the Latin American countries and try to improve on our skills. Made a lot of friends down there, and some of the, some of the people are still alive that I played for, and. Uh, it was just a very rewarding uh, experience. Uh, Campy and I played in Puerto Rico in 1940. We were about the same age. In order to get us to stay in Puerto Rico, they offered us uh, two acres of land. And we turned it down because we were, you know, tired of uh, hearing Spanish all spoken all the time, so we decided to come on home. And a few years later, there's where they uh, opened up the new San Juan Airport. So it shows you, shows you how smart we were. <laughs> I have to laugh about that when I think about it. But uh, I'm sure many of you, you know, know about Roy Campanella. And, and uh, he was my best friend. Even though we're friendly enemies, he was my best friend. I want to start you off by one story about Roy. And that happened in Mexico in 1942. 1942, uh, I was making $150. Now I'm supposed to be second to none now, making $150 a month, not a week, a month. <laughs> and uh, the same lady you saw the film, Mrs. Ethel Manley, I told her that I just got an offer to play in Mexico for $500 a month, plus $250 for a maid and a, an apartment and a maid. And she said, Mom, there's no way I can match that, so you just have to go. I said, OK, bye. I'll see you. <laughs> Went to Mexico. Two weeks later, here comes Roy. That was the same situation in, uh, in Baltimore. He played with the Baltimore Elite Giants. And uh, we happened to play each other at one particular day. And he said, he said, Mom, have you, ever, have you ever made so much money and had such a good time? He said, golly, he said, I'd play down here for nothing. You know, it's so wonderful down here. So now, in this last game of the season, we were playing them, and they were ahead one to nothing. And I came to the plate with two outs in the last inning. That little second baseman, Ray Dandridge, hit before me, hit number two. He's single. And now I'm in the batting circle. I'm getting ready to go up. And when I get ready to go up to the plate, George say, Monty, come here. So, uh, George, you know, get ready to hit. No, no, you come here. So I go over. He said, he leaned over, the, you know, out of his box and put his arm around me and said, uh, he said, uh, you hit a home run for me, huh? Just like that. I said, sure. <laughs> You see how hard that man's throwing the ball? I said, I'll try to keep the rally going. I can't promise you any, you know, I can't promise you a home run. He said, no, no, for me, you hit a home run, just like that. I said, well, I'll do, I'll do the best I can. So I go up, back to the, got in the, in the batting, uh, and I came up to, and came up to the plate, and Kirby says, what did George want, Monty? I said, he wants me to hit a home run. He looks up at me and says, you crazy? I said, well, that's what he wants me to do, Roy. At that time, I used to always take the first pitch because I had gotten it down to when I swung at a pitch, nine out of ten times, I was going to hit it anyhow. So the first pitch, you kind of look at it, you know, look at it, see what, you know, the speed of the ball and so on. And so call strike one. Second pitch was a curveball, and I fouled it over the grandstand. So something said, now, be ready because Campy is going to want to strike you out in a flourish in three pitches. So I guess fastball and got it and hit a home run over center field fence. And while I was, we were in the ball game now two to one. So while I'm crossing, you know, rounding the bases, George had come out of the box seat and met me at home at the home plate and shook hands and in his hand was $500 for hitting a home run. So 
camp. He hadn't gone in. He's jumping up and down. You got to be the lucky SOV. I said, I'll oh, stop. You know, stop ranting and raving. I said, just calm down. I said, George just gave me 500 and told me to give you 250 for calling the right pitch. <laughs> True story. True story. Anyway. And when I used to see him, you know, I used to go out to California to see him. Uh, when he was kind of feeling down and so on, I'd, you know, I'd say, you know, I'd remind him of that incident and get a little smile on his face and he'd start to feel better. But he was one of my very best friends and I, I sure miss him. Now, I can't uh, improve on what you just saw uh, too much because, it, uh, as I said, it was, it was, everything was said in there was just about true. Um, it was uh, a wonderful time because, uh, to come along because, uh, again, as a baseball player, we're making more money than the average person. I think at that time, around 1933, 34, 35, 36, the average salary must have been maybe $15 to $20 a week. And we're doing a little better than that, so at least, you know, we're you know, having fun or earning a living. And we try to play very well and improve our skills because we want to get, get, get picked to be uh, uh, chosen to go to the Latin American countries get away from the cold weather, plus again, to improve on our skills. So it was uh, like a year-round situation. We're young, we thought we had some talent, and we just had just a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, just to give you a little bit more about my background, uh, I'm, uh, I'm the, it was, it was 11 in my family, and as was mentioned, I, uh, uh, at eight years old, I came to Bloomfield, New Jersey, from Columbia, Alabama, and my father got a job working in a dairy. And I think at that time he was making about just about fifteen dollars a week. So uh, my sister was working, my brother was working, but we all lived in the same house, and uh, we survived because. We all cooperated, we worked together, and my mother was the greatest cook in the world. She could take anything and make it taste good. My father was very dedicated, he made sure that, you know, we uh, was taught the right thing and we did the right thing. And uh, even though he never laid a hand on me, in fact, he was my best friend, and he was till, until the day he died. Uh, she was a disciplinarian, she would, uh, uh, if you did something wrong, she'd make you go get a switch. And if the first switch wasn't big enough or thick enough, she'd make you go again. God forbid if you had to go a third time. So we, we grew up doing the right thing. We loved each other. Of the 11 of us, there's only three of us uh, alive. I had uh, four sisters and five brothers. And uh, the youngest now is 78, so. I'm almost, almost 84, have a brother in, uh, in uh, Palm Coast, Florida. Another, my youngest brother is in, in Greensboro, North Carolina. He was, athletic, he was coach and athletic director of Greensboro, uh, A&T University in Greensboro. And of course, I live in uh, Homosassa, Florida. That's down there where Ted Williams lived. Or lived. And uh, Mike Hampton, many of you know who Mike Hampton is, he's a star pitcher for the uh, Colorado Rockies. That's his hometown. It's a wonderful old community, and if you're ever that, down that way, please, uh, you know, stop in. Uh, just my wife and I, I have two daughters, uh, two granddaughters. My granddaughters live in, 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 uh, in Texas, Houston, Texas. One goes to, she, one's a senior. That's the Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. The other one goes to Loyola University in, in, uh, in New Orleans. They're the uh, apple of my eye because I have so much fun with them. I've seen them grow up to you know, wonderful, beautiful young ladies. And uh, I'm looking forward to one of these days to you know, great, great grandchildren. Uh, uh, got chance, I got a chance to take them to 
Cooperstown last year, and they loved it so much until they insist now on going, going back every year. Uh, <clears throat> I won't try to make any kind of formal speech, of course. I just want to tell you some of the experiences we had. <laughs> uh, you know, in the picture was mentioned, you know, about uh, you know how hard the conditions were. But tell me, believe me, it was a good time. When I say good time. Uh, we were young, and you know, we politically we weren't that uh, you know orientated. All we wanted to do was play ball, make ourselves happy, make our fans happy, and uh, you know, just just have fun, play, play baseball, and have fun, and uh, so that's the way we approach things. Uh, when we go down south, sometimes you know they uh, say some things, but they didn't say anything that we hadn't heard. So. Uh, one time we were in Daytona Beach, I remember, and uh, we're coming out of the theater to go to uh, the rooming house because we, you know, couldn't stay in a hotel. And a, uh, a young police officer stopped Max Manning and I. He's still alive, same age, lives in Atlantic City. I'll see him on Friday. And uh, he wanted to know where we're going. So I told him we just came out of the theater and we're going home. He said, "Well, you're out too late." I said, "Well, sorry about that." Uh, uh, you can bet if you let us go, uh, we'll go right on home, and uh, we won't be out late like this again. So that kind of cooled him off a little bit, and he let us go. And you can bet <laughs> from then on, we were, in, we were in the house before 9 o'clock. That's the way it was at that time. And Max, he thanks me today for being so calm because he wanted to get a little rambunctious, and I calmed him down. And uh, he, every time he sees me, he says, <laughs> you're my main man, because you just saved me. And uh, we, we laugh about that. Now, some of the things that happened, you know, we, uh, meal money at that time was a dollar, one dollar. Even before that, you know, you saw Buck Leonard. He was a, you know, just a wonderful person, one of the greatest ball players I've ever seen. First baseman, terrific. Just like Stan Musial, Lou Gehrig. And it was, he was humorous, he was comical. And he said, even before then, we got a dollar. He said, I used to get 50 cents to eat, you know, for meal money, 50 cents a day. And later on, I think around 1936, 37, they raised it to a dollar. So Buck said, when they raised it to a dollar, he said, he started, went downtown and started a little bank account. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? <clears throat> we could, we could eat two, Square meals on a dollar. In other words, uh, you, for 35 cents, you could get an entree, uh, two vegetables, dessert, and iced tea for 35 cents. And, uh, you know, you uh, tip the waitress maybe, a, you know, a, a, a nickel, and she's, you know, pretty, with, you know, she might get a dime. So then we'll have a few cents left. You know, you could eat again, and then you have a few cents left over for cigarettes. And, and so, but you could, you could eat real well on 35 cents a day. Now, you know, if you, if you, ate, if you, ate, if you ate three meals, then you're, you're in deep trouble. <laughs> but that's the way it was. And uh, <clears throat> um, it was just wonderful traveling around, uh, you know, we, uh, when, we, when I played on the Newark Eagles, we used to usually play in Syracuse, Rochester, Hartford, uh, Buffalo, and uh, we go uh, Pittsburgh, McKesson, uh, McKeesport, and we play around, you know, around the East. Some of the other clubs, of course, they played you know, like the Kansas City Monarch or the Homestead Grays. They travel all over. You know, they might play in Kansas City one day, St. Louis the next day, Birmingham, right on down the line, New Orleans. But we didn't travel that much. Once in a while, we got a chance to travel. And uh, wherever we went, we had never been, most of us had never been there before. So it was a new experience and gave us a chance to see the country firsthand. And uh, we, we, we really had a lot of fun. Now, uh, riding on a bus was, 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 was arduous, but we got to the point where we could uh, sleep on the bus better than we could in the bed. And uh, so uh, 
the way we used to beat that was to, as soon as you got on the bus, go to sleep, and then hopefully you would wake up uh, where you were going, you know. And so consequently today, when I get in the car, the first thing I do <laughs> is go to sleep. <laughs> and my granddaughter's the same way. <laughs> she takes it right after me, I tell you. <laughs> and I've told her the story, so uh, she, you know, she understands that. <laughs> Uh, some of the things that happened, you know, is just outrageous. For instance, we had a pitcher by the name of Terrace McDuffie. Terrace McDuffie was a star pitcher uh, behind Leon Day. And uh, he was, you know, a big, you know, good-looking guy, you know, dressed very well. So. But the traveling secretary, uh, he had a suspicion that that Mac couldn't, you know, couldn't read or write. So he said, you know, McDuffie, he said, I've been looking at you. He said, he said, uh, can you read, can you spell? <laughs> so Mac said, spell? Sure, I can spell, spell anything you want. He said, well, why are you so suspicious? He said, he said I notice every time I uh, talk to you about uh, uh, something, uh, get, or hand you the paper, you always tell me to read it. He said, why do you do that? He said, well, I want you, you to read it because I want to hear what it says. You know, that's, that was his excuse. So uh, I'll tell you what. He said, I bet you $5, McDuffie, that you can't spell 15. He said, 15? Anybody spell 15? He said, all right. I'll bet five. You pull up your, you give money your five, I give my five. And if you, uh, if you spell 15, the, uh, the $10 is yours. So we were now leaving Butler, Pennsylvania, going to McKeesport. So we said, to, now whenever you're ready, you just go ahead. So we must have ridden maybe two or three miles. He said, when are you going to start, McDuff? He said, I'm warming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, warming up. He said, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready, finally ready. He said, F-I-F-T-E-N, give me my damn money. You know, tells me to give him this money. I said, well, uh, uh, the traveling secretary said, no, that's not right. So he said, Monty, you spelled it for him, which I did. And he said, well, just because he had two weeks of college doesn't mean his, his mouth is a prayer book. So at that, he took out a long switchblade out of his back pocket, and he said, the way I say it, or the way I spell it is the way it is. So I said, McDuffie, the $10 is yours. <laughs> <laughs> So from then on, every time we see him, we says, Mike Duffy spelled 50. <laughs> that was the way it was for a very, very long, long time. Okay, I'm gonna you know, tell you a couple more stories and then uh, I want you to think of, uh, you know, some questions you might like to ask. Um, you know, how it was here, how it was there, what we do in certain situations and so on. What do you think, I want to think about baseball today and, and, and so on. So kind of start to think about it uh, j just a little bit. <laughs> Now, uh, Leon Day was our <clears throat> star pitcher, so when we'd go to the island, uh, we'd go to Puerto Rico, uh, we'd play on different teams. So Dobie and I, we played with, uh, with uh, San Juan, and, and Leon Ruffin and Leon Day played with Aguadilla, that's the city on the other side of the island, and uh, we played them. Uh, and first time I came up, I, uh, he knocked me down. I said, what, what, you know, what, Leon, what, what are you doing? why are you doing that? I said, I'm only hitting 250. He said, I'm gonna make sure you don't hit 251. <laughs> 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 That's how mean he was. <laughs> and then, and then in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Ponce one year, playing against Satchel Page, and I used to hold my bat kind of high when I was, you know, before I got ready to swing. So he struck me out four times. And he kind of liked me, and, you know, I, I was easy to get along with, and so was he. So he said, he used to call me, he said, Biggin, call me Biggin. You know, I made it about, I guess I weighed about 200. And he said, I want to talk to you after the game. I said, you want to talk to me? Yeah. He said, I want to try to tell you something about hitting. 
So after the game, we went to the local bar, and he said, he said, you'll never hit me. He said, I said, why? He said, you hold your bat too high. He said, by the time you get the bat down, he said, old Satch is by you and gone. <laughs> like that. <laughs> so he said, you better drop that bat. And he said, uh, maybe you, you know, you might hit a loud foul. So the next time we played them in about three weeks, they, play, he, they came over to San Juan. And uh, so now uh, we played one game in the morning and one in the afternoon. So we played the first game, and now he uh, came home, you know, went to my hotel so we could maybe get a sandwich and a bowl of soup and then go back to the bar park. So I said, Sash, you know, you know, the game's getting ready to start. We're still at the hotel. He said, what are you worried about? I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm the pitcher, and nothing can happen until I get there. So <laughs> sit down and enjoy yourself. Oh, we, <laughs> we, we showed up a little late. And uh, in that game, he only got me twice. He didn't get me four times because I was holding my bet a little lower. He'll, he got me two times rather than the four. So at least that was a 50% 50% improvement. What a character he was. Uh, I was saying at dinner that uh, he's one of the most unusual characters I've ever seen. Uh, he'd always have a, a story to tell or, or he'd do something uh, uh, out of the ordinary, but he, he was uh, you know, just, a, just a great, just a great, great character. And uh, I just wish that the, um, the Major League fans had had a chance to see some of these guys that, you know, that, uh, that you saw in the film. For instance, Oscar Charleston was, uh, he was the Willie Mays of his day. He might have been even a little better than Willie because he was a left-hand hitter, didn't fear left-handers, hit for very high average, great fielder. And between double headers, he used to put on a, a uh, throwing uh, uh, contest. He got the outfield and, and throw the ball in, one hopper to the catcher. And uh, he was, he's been generally voted the greatest of all the Negro League players, you know, everyday player. Of course, Satchel was the best pitcher, of course, and there were other great pitchers. And Josh Gibson was our best hitter. Buck Leonard was very close. Buck wouldn't hit the ball as far as Satchel, but he'd hit it almost as often as Satchel would. Just a wonderful, wonderful uh, person. And he just died at age 90 about, about four or five years ago. My, you know, we, we, we became very, very close. His, uh, his wife still lives in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And on November 7th, they're going to honor me down in uh, in uh, Homosassa, uh, Florida, and she's coming over with her daughter uh, from Rocky Mount to, to be, you know, to, to, to attend a dinner. Just an outstanding, outstanding person. Now, uh, very few of you have ever heard of Martin DeHigo. Martin DeHigo was a tall, regal Cuban, tall as satchel, right-hander, and very little difference between the two. In fact, uh, Castro has built a huge uh, statue in the in the plaza down there, honoring this great this great great uh, uh, player. So when he was uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame, some of the guys uh, said, uh, "Why did he go? Who you know who he?" I said, "Well, if you'd seen him play, <laughs> if you'd seen him pitch, uh, if you if you'd have seen him play anywhere, he could play." He, he played every position except catch. But if you put him at first base, he's the best first base. And put him at second, same thing, shortstop, right on down the line. Plus, he was a great hitter. And in 1942 in Mexico, his, his uh, ERA was 1.17. That's how good he was. They loved him in Cuba, Mexico, you know, Santa Domingo, and, uh, and Venezuela. Just an outstanding uh, a player. Uh, when Jackie got the chance uh, when he was signed. I was also contacted along with Roy. So uh, I asked Roy, see, the, the, the story was then that uh, Branch Rickey was going to start another uh, league, and they were going to play in Brooklyn. And 
we didn't know, you know, the, the true story, you know, what his real intentions were. So we're a little, you know, kind of, we were a little, uh, 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 you know, we, we just didn't know what was going to happen. So I said, well, uh, uh, I said, I'll talk to him, and, but, not, you know, I, I still want to know, you know, what to do. I said, what are you going to do, Campy? He said, no, I want to, you know, stay with the, stay with the, with the Elites. And then uh, after... Jackie was signed, and then we saw that the real intent was to bring, you know, the Negro Leaguers into the majors. Then Campy signed, I signed, along with, along with uh, uh, John Newcomb. And as Mrs. Manley said, uh, see, at the beginning, I signed with the Dodgers. I told them uh, I like to stay out of baseball just for a little bit because uh, being in World War II, I got, you know, had war nerves. I wanted, you know, to rest up. And, and uh, when I thought I was up to, you know, where I was, I went in the army as a 400 hitter and came out as a 300 hitter. I wanted to try to get myself together again, so that uh, you know I could play real major league baseball. So finally, and Jackie went into the majors in 1947, and I got the chance in 1949. And uh, at the beginning, just a little, you know, here I am, a little nervous because. Uh, uh, here I am playing against all these great players I had read about, you know. Uh, I'm talking about, I was a St. Louis Cardinals fan. You know, there was Eno Slaughter and, 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 uh, and Stan Musial and Harry Bikin and Marty Mary and Red Shandies and all these guys. And then, you know, ran on out through the league. It was just you know, these great players. And uh, so <clears throat> I didn't do well that first year. I was, you know, I had to get acclimated and then uh, the second year, I got you know I got going and and uh, and, uh, and start to play real good baseball. Then in 1951, Willie Mays came to our club, and uh, he made coming to the park a real delight because uh, you could see right at the beginning that he was a natural. I mean, by the way he handled himself, by the way he caught the ball, the way he threw the ball, uh, and the way he fielded the ball out in the outfield. So DeRosha. Uh, signed him to me, you know. I said, Monty, you take care of Willie for me. I said, well, I'll do the best I can. He said, uh, so actually, he was a diamond in the rough. All he needed was polishing up a little bit. And uh, after I showed him around the league the first time, uh, the next year, he, he, he showed me around. <laughs> he, he was that polished. And we didn't know, we knew he was a, you know, he could do, you know, run, hit, field, and throw, and hit, for, hit with power. But we did not know that he was going to become the, the, uh, the home run hitter that he became. That was the most amazing thing. He, you know, weighed about 185, and he was, he was uh, unbelievably strong. Plus, he was durable. You knew every day that he'd be in the lineup, and he'd be ready to play. And he loved to play, and he was easy to get along with. And uh, he was easy to coach. He would take. He would look at uh, other players and see what they would do, and he would try to improve uh, on uh, on his own skill. He developed the, that basket catch, which was you know uh, gave a little extra flair. People would come to the ballpark just to see him make the basket catch. And then for fielding, uh, I've never seen anybody. You know, I saw uh, a lot of great center fielders. You know, Terry Moore, Joe DiMaggio, and all the rest of them. Uh, Dominic DiMaggio and so on, placed on the field, Jim Pearsall, but never saw anybody that could feel like he could because it was his solemn duty if the ball stayed in the ballpark, it was his solemn duty to catch it. So in the 1954 series, when we played Cleveland, uh, Vic Worst came to the plate and he was playing, you know, we had a youngster by the name of John Little, left hander, threw the ball well. He was playing. Uh, words, pick words, and left center. The ball was hit to right center. It wasn't that way, it was that way. And there's no way that I thought he was going to catch the ball. And when he finally uh, made the catch, the throw was as, 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 was as amazing as the catch was because Dobie was on second base and he wheeled and turned the and threw the ball back to the infield so that Dobie wouldn't score 
on, on a sacrifice fly, from second base on a sacrifice fly. And so when we got the other out, we're running in together. I said, nice going, Rumi. I said, I didn't think you'd get to that one. He said, you kidding? He said, I had it all the way. <laughs> I said, you did, huh? OK. <laughs> but that wasn't his best catch. His best catch was in Brooklyn uh, because we're playing the Dodgers, and two outs, bases loaded. Sal Magley was pitching, and had a, the Dodgers had a youngster by the name of a, uh, Morgan. I can't think of his first name at the moment. Anyhow, utility infielder, Bobby Morgan. Yeah. And Bobby, he's, he, you know, Willie would play according to how fast the pitcher, you know, how fast he was, what he was going to throw, and so on. So he used, he kind of shaded him, being a pull hitter, he shaded him a little to the right in order to hit the ball to, uh, uh, to left field. And at the crack of the bat, the base is loaded. Uh, Bobby hit a uh, line drive in between left and center field. And at the crack of the bat, Willie left. And when he got from, oh, from here to that chair over there, he backhanded the ball, dived, backhanded the ball, held on to it. And his knee hit him in the head, and he knocked himself out, but he held on to the ball. So we thought well, he had killed himself. <laughs> yeah, so DeRocha ran out along with the trainer, and uh, he's down, you know, on the ground. So Leo said, uh, he said, Doc, uh, put a little smelling sauce, you know, see, you know, see if this will wake him up. So at that, he said, pull his eyelid back and, you know, see how his eyes look. And at that, a smile came on Willie's face. And Leo saw that he was OK. So he said, you know, he, what the hell are you doing, you know, scaring us like that? And he said, that's OK, Skip. I'm all right. I'm just resting. You understand? Know I had, had to run a long way for that one. <laughs> now, uh, there's a sports writer by the name of uh, Joe Reichler. He's the sports editor for the uh, Associated Press. He wrote about his nine best catches and he rated that one. Willie himself rated that one, and Joe also wrote about it. That was his greatest catch. But the game wasn't on TV, and uh, you know, no TV game. You know, we lost the game because Campanella came up in the next inning and beat us, hit a home run and beat us, th you know, three to two. But that was his greatest catch. And for some reason, he tries to downplay that 54 catch. But that was an uh, extra special catch too, in my estimation. And uh, so the best uh, player that I had seen uh, before uh, the war, before World War II, was Joe DiMaggio. Joe could do everything. Very graceful, uh, could hit, clutch hitter, look good, you know, great fielder, uh, real good arm, leader. And after the war, uh, it was Mays. Uh, you know, just, you know, just, just outstanding. So, you know, the, it's hard to compare one era with another. In other words, when they select an all-star team, you know, how can you leave off uh, Ted Williams? How can you leave off Mickey Mantle, Hank Aaron, you know, then you got Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, you know, Stan Musial. How can you leave off Stan Musial in anything? You know, and you got Frank Robinson, who, who's a great one, and, you know, right on down the line. So it's, it's, it's very tough to, uh, to, to compare. And uh, of course, you know, uh, opinions are like rear end. You know, we all have them. So, you know, so <laughs> you, know, you know, your guess is as good as mine. So I'm going to conclude now for a moment and uh, let you, you know, think about some things you would like to ask me. And before I do, though, I just want to say I want to thank, uh, uh, yeah, thank you, dear, for you know, invite, inviting us up. And nice to meet all these wonderful people. I hope you, you know, will learn just a little something from my conversation this evening, show you how it used to be and how it is now. Uh, the one thing I think that, uh, that uh, is, is uh, the difference, I think, is uh, the players of today, the they've never known adversity, not ever, you know. They don't know how it was in the old days. And uh, we used to be glad to come to the ballpark, glad to give an autograph, you know, glad to have a picture taken. Just happy to be alive, you know. Now, the, and, and of course, you know, didn't, we made no money, 
but uh, we do have great memories. Uh, players today, uh, I wish they were kinder, you know, more considerate, uh, satisfied with uh, with what they're making. Uh, you know how much you know how much is enough. They want every year they want to you know want more and more and more and then. Uh, the bad thing about today's contracts is that they'll sign you for 8, 10, 15, 10, you know, whatever, years, and it's guaranteed whether, whether, you, whether, you, you know, whether you get hurt or not. And I think that's like, uh, will kind of kill the incentive to, to get better, to improve yourself. But baseball is still a great game. Uh, I think it's still our number one pastime. I hope they can uh, settle this, this labor disputes so that we can get on an even keel and, and, and keep developing good players. As long as baseball can develop stars, uh, people that can run, hit, field, and throw, and hit with power, baseball will always be number one. Baseball is expanding to, uh, to Russia, to China, you know, to Japan, to all the Latin American countries, to Australia, and uh, it's just one great game. And if it had not if, it's, if it were not for the fact that it is the greatest game, it would have been, the owners would have killed it and the players would have killed it a long time ago. You know, I was looking at a game the other night and the uh, athletics uh, were ahead. You know, they're trying to win their 20th game. You know, ahead, 11 to nothing. <laughs> and wound up, you know, the ninth inning, 11 to 11. You know, did anybody see that game or stay up that late? <laughs> and then, the, you know, the pinch hitter came in and hit a home run and, and, the, and the A's, uh, Broke the, uh, you know, broke the record in the American League, you know, for for the consecutive games won. So it shows you, you know, what a great game it is, and I just hope that uh, it will always remain that way. So now I've talked enough. Uh, how about uh, you fellows and ladies? I'm, so, I'm glad to see so many ladies out here. Uh, uh, ask me a few questions. See if I can answer them. I noticed when you were talking about your All-Star team there, you uh, definitely didn't mention. Uh, Ty Cobb, and you were, you were probably too young to uh, never did see Ty Cobb. Ever see him, but you must have you must have heard stories about him. Yeah, had a lot of stories about Ty. Not not only I heard that uh, Ty Cobb was even better than Babe Ruth. That's what a lot of people. You know, I had some I talked to some people. And they said that, but Babe Ruth, why, Babe got so much publicity is the fact that he saved uh, baseball, that he you know started the the home run trend, and he was so colorful. And he would always come come through in a, in, in a crucial situation. So, uh, but a lot of people said all around Cobb was, Cobb was better. And you know, again, you know, it's just a matter of opinion. But Babe Ruth is, is regarded as the greatest that ever played it because he saved baseball. See, when, when I was coming along, baseball was king. If you thought about playing professional sport, you thought about baseball. Football wasn't big, basketball wasn't big, even golf and tennis wasn't that, wasn't that big. So everybody, every, every city, every uh, town, every you know, community, uh, every county had a baseball team. And everybody on a Saturday afternoon or Sunday used to flock to the baseball park. Now you got a lot of competition, uh, particularly, you know, from, from uh, uh, from football and basketball and, and, and uh, you know, uh, car racing, you know, uh, is, is, is the big sport now. So now we, we, the baseball players have to realize that uh, they're not only, it's not the only game in town, they've got to change, make the players realize too that they're very fortunate to come along at this time and be appreciative. Do some autographing, make some public appearances, you know, be kind to youngsters. You know? Let's change the image and let's, you know, I, I always say PFP, pay for performance, like it is in golf. If you play well in golf, then you get paid well. I think if somehow if they could reduce the, you know, the 10-year contracts and so on to maybe just two years, you, you see, but to say that's unconstitutional and so on, and, and uh, you know, so I hope the union, uh, the Baseball Players Association will realize all this and, and uh, try to get their act together. Now, uh, the contract, you know, there'll be a new contract in, in four years. And uh, we'll have to see, you know, what the attitude is.
but I'm sure that the the, the baseball commissioner and the new new owners uh, will will try to uh, uh, relay this message to them and talk to them and tell them uh, we're not the only game in town. Baseball's not the only game in town. Uh, of all the pitchers you faced in any league, who's the one that gave you the most trouble? Uh, there was a pitcher uh, that played for the pitch for the state with the. Uh, Cincinnati Reds, his name was Yule Blackwell. Yule Blackwell pitched just like uh, Randy Johnson only came from the right side. And I gotta tell you a little story about it. Uh, when he threw you a curveball, he did you a favor because by coming from the side, you, you couldn't see the ball until he got about right there. You know, he was very fast and he was mean. You know, you, if you took a healthy you know, swing, he'd probably knock you down the next pitch. So we were playing him one day in the polo grounds and uh, that, uh, I hit a home run off him to win the game. Uh, he's a right-handed pitcher and I'm a right-handed hitter. I hit the foul pole down the right field line about 263 feet to beat him a game. So as I'm rounding the bases, you know, he's saying, hey, SOB, you'll never do that again, you know. Uh, uh, you're lucky, you know, you SOB. I said, well, I might not do it again. I said, but I did at that time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the next time we played him, he got me three balls and no strikes. So I figured, you know, I'm gonna dig in now and you know get this, hit this uh, cripple, what we call it. And he hit me here, right here in the side, and the ball came out this side. <laughs> so I'm down on the ground, moaning and groaning, and uh, Leo comes up to the plate and he says, "Show him up, Monty." He said, "Don't rub." I said, it hurts, Leo. It hurts. He said, show him up, don't rub. So I got up, finally went to first base, and he said, show him up again. He said, steal it. I took one step, fell flat on my face. I was out for two weeks. Broke, broken rib, true story. And uh, he was the toughest. Now, uh, Robin Roberts was very tough. Big Don Newcomb was very tough. Big Bob Rush was very tough. Harry Bikin, left-hander. Very, very tough. So they had a lot of good pitchers. And, uh, and uh, I think the pitching in those days is a little better than it is today, simply because, you know, you had fewer teams and, uh, you know, you stayed in the minors a little, little longer so they could learn your trade very well. That's my, that's my opinion. Oh, well, uh, yeah. On, uh, number one, uh, most of the players were young and they hadn't, you know, hadn't gotten married. so. You know, the unmarried guys, uh, you know, it was just a one big ball for them, you know, traveling around, playing ball, a little money in the pocket and so on, you know what I mean? Always looking for a new girl to meet and so on. And, uh, but the older guys, they got married and uh, they were, you know, would take their families to Puerto Rico, Cuba, Mexico, Venezuela, you know, and so on. And uh, they would play year round so that, uh, you know, they could, the, the Latin American countries paid more money. Some, and a lot of the guys married are Latin American guy, uh, girls, you see, and, and raised family. Um, I guess maybe 10% did that, you understand? So, uh, uh, now, the caliber of baseball was real good. It was almost major league. It wasn't, you know, not every, cause, simply because we played less games. Now, when we played in Puerto Rico, like I said, we only played three games, one on Saturday and two on Sunday. All right, we go to Cuba, Cuba, we played uh, four games a week. The rest of the time, you could go fishing, go to the beach. Just a wonderful country. Go to the nightclub, you know. Uh, just whatever you want to do. And then, and again, we get making about three times as much as we used to make in the, in the Negro League. But always somebody come over and want to, you know, buy a meal or send you a drink or something. So it was wonderful. So now that was in 1942. Now in 1943, when I'm getting ready to go back, uh, they said, no, you got to, you know, take your... Uh, if you pass, if you don't pass your test, you can go back there, but if you do, you got to go into the Army. So I had to, you know, I passed and I went into the Army. Got into the Army in World War II, they treated us terrible over there, so uh, I wanted to be in Mexico, I didn't want to be in the Army. Mm. <laughs> but it was real good baseball. There was good baseball because, you see, in order to play in that league, you had to be the best because there are a lot of players, and only the best was selected. And if uh, they didn't, if there weren't, 
who are not enough native players, then they would import players from the United States, black or white. You know? So we, you know, I played against Erskine and Chuck Connors and you know, a lot of guys, uh, uh, Newcomb in, the, you know, in Cuba. And, uh, and the baseball was good. And the crowds were huge. They were, you know, they uh, very enthusiastic. They, they had built a new stadium called El, El Stadio Cero, new stadium. And uh, we held about 50,000. And on a Sunday, you know, you play what they call a 14 double header. And it was just wonderful, wonderful uh, baseball. Now, uh, back in 1947, uh, Fidel Castro uh, was, he was a, an Almond, Almond Dairies fan. He, that was the team that he would like. The two teams were like Brooklyn and, and, the, and the New York. We were the, uh, we, we, we were the New York and, uh, and Havana, the other team, was, you know, like Brooklyn. And uh, so he used to come out and pitch batting practice. He wanted to become a, a, a pitcher. And he didn't have, but he didn't have, you know, very much talent. He was, he was, he was in college then. So we said later that if we knew, had known, if we had known that he wanted to become a dictator, we would have made him an umpire. You know? <laughs> <laughs> would have had all that trouble. <laughs> And he still likes baseball. And I predict, I predict one year, that, uh, and one year soon, that we got the, the Cuba's going to open up, and I think baseball's going to lead the way because there's some, still some great Cuban players down there, and uh, and uh, I think uh, that will be the catalyst to you know our new uh, friendly relations with Cuba. I hope it happens as soon as it can. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I thank everyone for coming. <laughs> I think we are going to have to. Be <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.